you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sitting there chatting to her. Yeah. This is all very serious stuff, guys. It's, it's a bit serious, early, but isn't as, it? For uh, this serious as the mayor stuff? said, if it's me measurable, it's manageable. <laughs> it's menopausal. I think you said. <laughs> Maybe even menopausal. Anyway, um, Stella McCartney, welcome. Thank Thanks you for, for having, having me. us on this stage to talk about a really crucial element of trying to achieve sustainability and try to combat climate change. Who knew? I didn't know that the fashion industry is the second biggest polluter in the world. That is a dramatic statement. Maybe all of you knew that. I didn't know it. What, it's not something to be proud of, no. really, is it? No, and what can you do, sorry to put you on the spot, but you are already doing, and you've got a charter that you've started mm -hmm. and you've got others who've come onto it in, in, um, in uh, conjunction with what's happening at the COP24 mm -hmm. in Poland. What can you do as a leading designer to help change the situation we're under? Well, you know, for me, this is something I've always done. It's been at the core of my um, business model, really, as much as trying to create desirable and luxurious and beautiful products. But um, the core situation is, is sourcing. Um, really, the manufacturing is, is a second sort of impact on everything. But what I do, the biggest impact I have in a positive way on the environment and the fashion industry is I don't use leather, which is something people don't really want to talk about. Um, so I don't use leather, which means that I'm not using the chemicals for the tanning, I'm not cutting down forests to kill the cows, I'm not using water inefficiently, I'm not using grain inefficiently, I'm not using chemical glues that are boiling down bones or fish bones. Um, so that's the biggest impact I have. Um, and really the, the second thing I'm looking at, the main thing I'm looking at right now is regenerative agriculture, which is, is really interesting, it's fascinating. Basically. Um, terrestrially, soil um, is basically ca it basically captures more carbon than than basically it's it's got twice as much carbon in the soil, not to be released hopefully than in the atmosphere. So this is just biodiversity looking at organic cotton growing, for example, and trying to really treat the soil with respect, putting the nutrients back in. I mean, fashion essentially is is farming. So, you know, and, and actually trying to look at the entire circular economy of the whole thing. So let's just take a sort of a practical experiment. Um, Stella, I am all Stella. I'm, as she would say, punked out in Stella McCartney. It's been lent to me for this event. Um, I'm very proud to be wearing she can, it. You can have it. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm not trying allowed. to get that suit. Just take the <laughs> suit. Not allowed, not allowed. Um, <laughs> you can buy it. The reason, it's, the reason we're on, we're, I'm wearing it and you're wearing it, obviously, is because I would like to break down how you do the alternatives. If you say that you never use leather, which I know, your shoes look leather. The handbag that I'm carrying looks leather. This is Stella's handbag. Um, all of the fabrics are sustainable fabrics, organic, and also, as you say, have a very, very specific supply chain, with, which I think a lot of it is in Europe, so we can get to the whole Brexit fallout on that in a moment, if you like. But let's, let's just talk about, then, what I'm wearing. This is a wool and cotton on the inside, a little viscose. viscose. This is silk, but also viscose. So what happens with me is I over we found out, because we do our EPNL, our environmental profit and loss, every year we do our numbers. We're very transparent with them. We're one of the very few fashion houses that discloses that information. What we found out is over 60% of our positive impact environmentally starts at the sourcing. So, um, and we do it all internally. We're a fairly small brand. We have zero incentives. It's something that I'm sort of starting to try and encourage now. My, it's my personal belief, but really when I export into the United States, for example, a non-leather good, I can get taxed up to 30% more bringing that product into the, into the States, which must be a medieval law, kind of sort of going back to cattle or something. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't encourage, so there's zero incentive. Coming back to your question, um, I took three years um, working just internally, um, developing a viscose, a rayon for the Americans in the room, that was sustainable. Does anybody in the room know where viscose comes from? Anyone? Somebody, there's a hand. Where does it come from? It comes from trees. Well done. Um, so basically, last year, 100 million trees were cut down just for viscose. This year, it's 150 million trees. So I took three years sourcing from a sustainable wood source. If I can do that, please, dear God, can't everyone in the industry do that? You know, I'm a relatively small label. So we've done things like that. We're just developing daily 
new ways of sourcing a better and more sustainable material. Uh, and because we all use the same materials in fashion. Everybody uses the same supply chain. There's about 10 materials that everybody's been using for hundreds of years. So just to be clear, you take your wood from specifically it's grown, trees, sustainable yeah. so forests in Sweden? Yeah. And then it gets mulched in? It basically gets mulched in Sweden and then it, it, the whole supply chain is really where it sort of falls yeah. down for the fashion industry. They don't ask questions, they don't challenge. Most, supply, most fashion houses have no idea where their products are coming from, their materials. Their, so we take, but we take it to the same luxurious, incredible mills in Italy. You know, and that's, and, and that's where we're creating yeah. change because at first we got a lot of resistance from some of the most creative and beautiful mills because you shouldn't have to sacrifice luxury for, for sustainability. You know, you shouldn't know that these are not leather shoes. You shouldn't know that this is an organic cotton lace. These are things that, in my mind, it should just be part of the process. And, and that's the change, I think, that needs to happen. So I guess in an environment like this, which is, I think, mostly business leaders um, and interested parties in that regard, and you, you've just said it's really expensive and the price point is also an issue. And you talked about the incredible tax that you get mm. in the United States. Who eats that? Is it, is it you? you? <laughs> I don't put it on. I don't believe in putting that onto my my consumer. You know, it's my personal belief. It's the way I wish to conduct myself in my business, and it's not their fault that I'm, you know, a vegetarian and I'm an environmentalist. But um, yeah, so I, I take that in my margin. And but you know, there's been a lot of talk about policy change. It does have to happen. We have to have support. I think the fact that we came together over 20 industry leaders for COP24 and um, worked together on 16, you know commitments, it's showing that the fashion industry has to take responsibility and we need to work with policymakers to really incentivize, to create laws. You know, the fashion industry is getting away with murder. I mean, we are literally getting away with murder. We're killing billions of animals a year for handbags and shoes. And, and you know, it's not really very luxurious in my opinion. And I mean, the statistics stage. are, when it comes to waste, for instance, and we live in a disposable society, it's not just fashion, it's everything. We yeah. think we can just use, dump, and, and buy again. One garbage truck worth of clothing is either burned or sent to a landfill every second. So nearly half of this building has been filled with fast fashion since we've been talking. And that's, that's I mean, that I can't even believe that, and I'm in this conversation every single day. And the reality is, is that, you know, people wear on average fast fashion up to three times before it's, it's just thrown away. And it's, you know, there's a, there's a conscious consumption conversation that has to be had. That's not alliteration, it's something else. But, um, you know, we need to educate. We need to have, have different ways of having the conversation so people are more mindful of the impact. But I do believe it's the business leaders and the, and the politicians that need to really take control. I mean, the reality on that fact that you say, Waste is actually, as a business person, I think that waste is the biggest opportunity. And I work with many, many tech companies. The future of what I'm looking at is how technology can save the fashion industry, really, and the problems that we face. There's over 500 billions worth of waste a year in the fashion industry. Now, if that's not a business opportunity, I don't know what is. I mean, yeah. And I Please, mean, dear God, make it a business yeah. opportunity, because otherwise, you know, what are we going to do? Well, you, you keep talking about fast fashion. Obviously, that's not what you're in. So your, your dilemma is being a conscious designer and a conscious consumer to try to get people to be able to afford it. And then you've got the high street, the fast fashion, the H&Ms and this and that, who everybody can afford practically, but they contribute to so much waste. Now H&M yeah. &M has signed on, including obviously Burberry, Adidas, et cetera, to your, um, the, the fashion charter associated with COP24. What will that mean? Is that, is that a major game changer if a major high street fast fashion house signs on to? Yeah, I mean, those the two examples that you use there, apart from Burberry, actually, they're, they're already quite in the conversation and have been for some time. I work with Adidas. Um, and they, they taught me things about, for example, not using PVC. I didn't really know that PVC was hugely sort of cancerous to the people that work with it and incredibly sort of unenvironmentally friendly. So I think it, I guess that example means that if we work together as an industry, mm -hmm. then we can show that there is a will and where there's a will, there's a way. And taking responsibility, you know, so I think these big industry leaders, you know, they have a much bigger impact than I do. Um, and if we're all in the conversation together and we all start talking about our supply chains together, we can create a solution, you know? And I think it's just taking responsibility at this stage. 
I think the, gut, the, the business leaders have to sort of man up and it can't just be, I mean, the other thing is, I say it can't just be about the bottom line, but actually, my, you know, every single brand in the world is trying to target X, Y, and Z, poor, these poor, vulnerable young children that are trying to get targeted and they are the future and they will not stand for it. And I think that's why this conversation is so valid right now and why people are pricking up their ears in my industry because they're seeing that the youth of, of their consumer actually will not stand for anything less. So, so do you think this is a moment, <clears throat> because a, a pre, the previous panel talked about, and Radhika Jones talked about, you know, we cannot keep catering and pandering to the small handful of deniers who have a disproportionately loud voice and disproportionately, you know, disproportionate power. In the United States, as we know, the current administration does not believe in man-made climate change and are busy deregulating some of the most toxic uh, pollutants. And yet, as Mayor Bloomberg has said, um, cities and states and individuals in the United States are working very hard to counter that mm. trend. We've seen millennials are really on this issue to the point of demonstrations and I, mm. I assume sort of purchasing decisions that they make. Um, you know, one of the motivators, I think, for people is hope rather than doom yeah. and gloom. Yeah. And I wonder whether in your industry or in the climate debate in general, you feel potentially the narrative needs to be changed to, to show people where they're actually making positive changes by their choices. Yeah, I mean, my, you know, I grew up with these conversations. Um, and I remember being younger and when it was really not a conversation that people understood or were willing to have. I would get met with a lot of aggression, a lot of defensiveness. And um, it wasn't a pleasant conversation to have. I mean, that's vastly changed now. Now people are like, OK, it's not weird that you're not having a big piece of meat sitting next to me at dinner. You know, they understand it. It's, it's part of our life choices now in everything that we do. I, I personally find that trying to encourage people, trying to give people light information, um, tr you know, options of small little things they can do in their life every single day that can make big changes, um, so, yeah, my tone of voice at, at Stella McCartney is very much sort of trying to use humour, trying to kind of also, you know, there are hard-hitting facts that we do give, but I think that we try and sort of supply a sort of sexiness to it and a luxury to it. You know, I'm in an industry that I'm not... It's a delicate balance yeah. to find. But, um, you know, I think you have to have hope. You have to. I've got four kids, you know, it's, it's partly my fault. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but you know, you have to have hope and you have to give them some kind of chance to, to find a solution. So I think I'm correct in saying this building was the first entirely sustainably built building. Um, yours is very sustainable. You've moved shops mm -hmm. and you've created a whole different environment in your new shop. And you sort of said that you're sort of moving into being a scientist more than a designer yeah. and you're really interested in tech innovation. What have you done with your shop? how much of your time is in the lab, so to speak, rather than on the drawing board? I mean, when I was 10 and I was looking at my mum and dad's, you know, wardrobe, I did not think that I'd be sitting doing conversations like this. I, mean, I just want to be a fashion designer. It's simple. Um, but, yeah, everything we do. So, I mean, I think that's really the conversation. It's not just the product. It's the entire business model that, you know, adheres to these kind of beliefs. So our stores, where they can be, they're using solar power, they're using wind power. Our new store on Bond Street has amazing technology in it. We have this um, tech called um, Air Labs. It's a British company, actually. And it filters out 98% of the pollutants in the air. Um, I was asking Mr. Bloomberg if they had that in here, but I guess you, sort of, you just walk in and you're, you're pure in this building. I don't know. But um, <laughs> I always say to the guys that work in my store, I'm like, you guys are like getting younger when you work in here. You should be paying me to work in this store. But that kind of technology, we've got, we've got biodegradable mannequins. I think we're probably the only fashion house in the world to have. Does that sound sexy, biodegradable very, mannequins? Very, I'm like, very. that's not a trigger word on sort of sexiness, is it? Um, we might have to change the language. No, it is. It's new. It's <laughs> Different. And we have, you know, tons of recycled fabrics. Actually, the best one, which I love, is all of the waste in our office. We shredded and we took it down to a pulp and all of the walls on the second floor are paper mache with all of the shredded research from our office.
Is it, and it looks beautiful. So there's tons of things like that. There's many more. Uh, you know, you mentioned your, your parents. Um, your mother was famously, I would say, she introduced vegetarianism mm -hmm. certainly to this country. Yeah. Um, so you learned about this from the very beginning. She obviously had an influence on your father and therefore on you. Your sister is very much, she's guest edited one of the most recent issues of oh. National Geographic yeah. and talks about the environment and et cetera. I feel like I was lucky to work for a man, Ted Turner, who was not only cable before cable was cool, but he was climate before climate Definitely. was cool. And just to say that it's really important to get this sensibility in your DNA mm -hmm. really early. I guess you're saying that that's beginning to happen, but how did your parents influence you and how did you observe your mother being treated and potentially laughed at mm -hmm. with her, at, at the time, offbeat ideas? Yeah, I mean, you know, it was a really weird conversation to have 40 years ago to not eat animals. The concept was mostly sort of reserved for religious purposes. Um, so my mum was a big advocate in that. She was very vocal. Um, she was married to probably one of the most famous men on the planet, so she was already in trouble, essentially. Um, and she wasn't afraid, you know, to stick up for the animal rights. And that's a conversation that I find when I'm having these conversations that's still yet to be had. Mm -hmm. When are we going to talk about actual animal cruelty in the fashion industry? Um, and that, we'll save that for another time. But um, so she was very vocal. Um, we grew up on an organic farm. Um, and it was very much at an early age I realized the soil conversation, the idea that we have to work in harmony with our fellow creatures, we have to be respectful of, of sort of rotation cropping and really understand how nature works, you know? It was a big part of my upbringing. And I look now at what I do for a living and I'm like, it's, very, it's not very different. You know, one of the biggest materials we use is cotton, mm -hmm. um, organic, but it's cotton still and that's a crop, you know? So I've sort of made the links, I think, as I've I, 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 I find it quite sweet and interesting that at 11 years old, your first piece of clothing <laughs> yeah. was a fake suede pink bomber jacket. A biodegradable fake suede. How, how did you know? <laughs> You know, it's funny, I, was, I don't think I had any other option, you know, we were a very famous right. vegetarian and sort of animal activist family. But I remember my mum and dad always said, look, you don't have to do this, if you want to eat meat, you can. Not that I could. Um, <laughs> but I do it with my kids now, you know, my kids are all veggie and they sometimes say to me, why are we, you know, when they were younger, they'd be like, why are we vegetarian? And the minute you say to a child, I'm a vegetarian because I don't want to kill an animal to eat it, they're like, oh my God, do you kill animals? To like, you know, mm. kids don't want to do that. And so it makes perfect sense, you know, when, once you sort of explain it. See, I, I'm not sure what this means. I'm usually really good at timekeeping. Oh, it's keeping, zero, it's zero, zero, zero. Red. And it's red. It's like red. So I think, I think our time is up. I'm focusing on the cacti. Yeah, the cacti are beautiful. <laughs> but just, you know, Stella said you'll have the conversation another time about, about cruelty to animals. It is a conversation that needs to be had now. And I just end with your mother's fairly famous quote. If all the slaughterhouses had glass walls, there would be no more slaughter of animals. I totally agree with yeah. that. Anyway, congratulations Thank for, you for whatever me, guys. all that you're doing.